So this is kind of pretty much the rig that I used to record the record, save for one or two bits of gear, just the usual dumbbells and all that kind of stuff. But um, joking aside, I've always been fairly confident in terms of just using gear that I'm familiar with. I think is infinitely better than just having access to amazing gear, which I'm not necessarily familiar with, because you're going to spend, you know, an inordinate amount of studio time. Then time is money, trying to dial in an amp that you're not particularly familiar with. And when we went in to record the album, we'd literally just come off tour, um, having been out doing O2 Academies and stuff around the UK, Shepherd's Bush Empire, those kind of sized places, and I'd done the entire tour with this rig, so I'd kind of dialed it into a point where I was pretty happy with it. So I thought, well, let's just use that you know let's kind of delve in and start using it and if there's certain bits or certain sections of tracks which feel like they're calling out for something else then we'll approach those later on but for the most part of it um, this was the rig for the album um, starting at the start I guess the things that make the noise we've got Fender Pro Reverb um, which is currently back in its original stock guys I did have a Jensen speaker in there um, which then blew up during the recording process of the album um, so I stuck the original uh, the Neodymium 1x12 in there um, so that's back in its stock state at the moment, as is the Victory Copper Deluxe. Um, obviously, kind of Victory's take on a kind of very voxy, shouty kind of mid-range, does that aggressive, slightly on the edge of breakup thing very nicely. Um, we'll get on to how they sound in a minute. But in regard to the pedal board then, the Talent Enhancement Center. Um, first in the chain, which I always forget to mention, is the wah pedal. I'm not even sure what this is, to be honest. I think it's a BBE wah, maybe. Um, the logo has long fallen off it, um, but just, you know, I mean, it's nothing particularly kind of revolutionary about this. Um, it does. It took me a very long time to trust myself with a wild pedal, um, just because you inevitably turn into um, all of the usual suspects that kind of maybe overuse a wild pedal, not to name any names. But there's a couple of moments in the set where that gets used almost as a kind of filter more than it is a. I've run out of ideas, let's step on the wild pedal and see what happens, which is kind of what I'm trying to avoid, I guess. Um, moving on to the main board itself then, the first pedal in the chain, um, which it kind of requires that it has to be, is the Mythos Golden Fleece. Um, I think this is called the Blackout version. Um, so who knows whether that's going to show up on camera or not. It's a single knob fuzz. Um, fuzz, I tend to struggle with a little bit in isolation, just in terms of its very kind of serrated edge kind of buzzsaw kind of aggressive kind of thing so in isolation doesn't get a lot of use but for the purposes of demonstration sounds a little bit like this background noise that you get with fuzz it's a great sounding pedal but in isolation just don't tend to use it all that much so that either gets stacked with any number of the overdrives all of which sound absolutely identical on uh, microphone i'm sure for argument's sake it's now black box with the mythos sounds a little bit like this and a tremolo Fattens out that mid-range, it's a little bit more kind of Eric johnson I guess, for want of a better phrase. Um, so that um, is a specific moment, actually. There's one or two moments where that gets dragged out uh, with the Jazz Master, which we'll come over to in a moment. But um, for anyone familiar with Cardinal Black, my band, this is a track will tell me how it feels. Um, the solo of which is pretty much that combination. When I recorded that initially, it was the Golden Fleece and the uh, Gunshot. Just for whatever reason, it's a kind of myriad of different overdrives these days. Um, so if we stack that with, say, the King of Tone, that's kind of the Tell Me How It Feels solo.
which I'm sure without any context um, is thoroughly confusing. But that's that sound uh, for that part of the set. Moving on to, um, as I said, the overdrives. The first overdrive in the chain then is the Snaps Black Box, kind of a fairly accurate one-to-one -one recreation of the old Marshall Blues Breaker from the 90s. Save for all of the kind of many idiosyncrasies that you used to get with that pedal. I've got one of the original Blues Breakers, um, which works as long as it's in one specific setting. Any, anything outside of the sweep of where it currently is set and has been set for about the past 10 years on the pots, then it doesn't work. So um, that's not entirely practical, as good as that one position does sound. So I've got the Snouse Black Box, um, which is brilliant in that it works in all positions on the, on the sweep of the, uh, the knobs. So clean tone. <laughs> Wait for the reboot to tail off, fairly subtle, not kind of anything too drastic. That's pretty much how all of my overdrive pedals are set because it allows me to then stack them together. So it's not like, oh, that's that overdrive for that. The good, good thing about that, I guess, then to a degree is that, you know, depending on which venue you're in, maybe you feel like you need slightly less overdrive than you did the night before, in which case you don't stand on that overdrive. Or maybe you feel like you need a, a little bit of extra love, so you give it a little bit more overdrive than the night before, as opposed to having set and forget overdrives where it's kind of one sound fits all, I guess, in theory. Um, so that's the Snouse Black Box. Um, moving on in the chain, we've got an interesting one. It's the Small Speaker Overdrive uh, by Great Eastern Effects. Kind of does that sort of small amp on the edge of about to implode kind of thing quite nicely. Again, in isolation, it's fairly aggressive, um, which is a cool sound in itself. Not the not one that I tend to get a hell of a lot of use out of, but sounds a little bit like this. Fairly aggressive, like I said, if you stack that with, say, the Mythos Molnia, which is the next overdrive in the chain, you get this. Almost like a kind of subtle fuzz pedal, I guess. This sort of the way it kind of farts out very slightly, at least the combination of those two pedals, is a little bit reminiscent of a fuzz pedal, but still maintaining a little bit of kind of clarity, I guess, which is quite nice. Um, the Mythos Molnia, then, the one that was stacked with, um, is obviously kind of Mythos take on a Klon kind of st style circuit, I guess. Fairly mid pokey, um, so that in isolation takes it from this. <laughs> Fairly subtly set again, but if you stack that with the Snouse Black Box, you get... Especially for that kind of edge breakup pushed chord thing, those kind of combination of pedals work particularly well. Uh, moving on to uh, the main overdrive pedal of the board, I guess, um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, a degree of unobtainium about it, I guess it is the Analog Man King of Tone. Um, it's just a great sounding overdrive pedal, originally kind of derived, I guess, from a Blues Breaker style circuit, but then tweaked from what I've read at least. Um, so at least kind of two Blues Breaker style circuits, I guess, on this board, which, as you would expect, stack particularly well. So the King of Tone um, sounds a little bit like this. <laughs> Thank 
probably the most drastic in terms of the three overdrive pedals and how they're set. It's the one that there is a fairly marked difference when you kick it on, I guess. Um, like I said, it's almost a shame that it sounds as good as it does because it's not really a pedal that you can easily recommend to anyone who's looking to try and get that sort of sound, at least without an inordinate amount of money on reverb or probably a four or five year waiting list or whatever it happens to be at this particular moment in time. Um, although I guess there is the MXR, the Duke of Tone, whatever it is, which has obviously just come out recently. Uh, moving on, we have the Jackson Audio Bloom, uh, a compressor pedal. I'm not a massive compressor guy, but this one particular track um, in the live set and on the album, call it on my own, which kind of calls for it. Um, it's set fairly drastically um, in accordance with that track, so it takes it from uh, this, which is the riff without it on, to this. Just holds on to the notes that little bit longer, which then, when that's kind of drenched in reverb and stuff, as it actually is when I play it live, really helps just those notes pop out a little bit more. Uh, sounds a little bit like this. Needs more reverb, I think. Um, I like that you get, when it's set that kind of drastically as well, you get that kind of pop at the front end of the note. Um, which is a particularly cool sound on the record uh, that was recorded on a Gibson 355 with a very tone in position two, so the kind of first position, I guess, where it's actually doing anything, um, for no other reason other than I didn't notice it was on at the time. And we got about halfway through the track and realised that the very tone was engaged. I was like, oh, that's why it sounds so weird. But it kind of defined, inadvertently kind of defined the sound of the track a little bit. So um, I've been using that live in some scenarios. It's the kind of difficulty, I guess, in playing live is that as much as it's tempting to use exactly the same guitars or exactly the same gear that you did on the album, the reality of that then can be a little bit of a kind of guitar switcheroo kind of nightmare in between songs, which I just, for me, spoils the flow of the gig. Part of the fun of the show is almost pacing it a little bit like an album, you know, you kind of decide on the length in between the tracks, whether you roll straight into one track off the back of another or whether it's a bit of a gap and a bit of talking or whatever. So if it falls in a place in the set where it kind of feels natural to maybe, oh, I'll switch out that guitar and do it on the guitar that was used on the record, more power to it. If not, just kind of crack on with whatever you have in your hands, which in most scenarios is this, the Yamaha Revstar. Um, the next pedal in the chain um, is the kind of do-it-all solo boost. It's the EP Booster. I'm tempted to get another one of these, actually, and have it on all the time at the front of the chain because it just, it just makes everything sound better. It's just one of those kind of more pedals, I guess. Bit of everything, bit of kind of sparkly top end, bit of kind of fat low end. Um, won't make a great deal of sense in this video, I guess, without the context of kicking it on. It takes people's heads off for a solo, but I guess the difference of it on and off is this. It's just one of those things that you turn it on and everything instantly sounds better and nicer. Um, the next pedal in the chain is the Moore uh, Trilocopter, which is again used for two points in the set actually, for that very kind of drastic sort of choppy trem, I guess, which you know ordinarily amp trems don't quite do. Um, so that in uh, combination with a couple of delays and overdrives and all that kind of stuff um, for the start of Tell Me How It Feels sounds a little bit like this. Not going to set the world on fire, but does that sound kind of as I want it to do it, really? Which is um, all you can ask of a pedal that probably costs about three pence. Um, next in the chain, uh, we have the Echo Rec by Catlin Bread. Um, been there since the day I bought it, which was the day that it was actually released. Um, I'd been obsessed with the Echo Rec sound for years, and soon as soon as I saw there was a pedal which actually professed to do that sound, um, bought it. Great sounding pedal, um, sounds like this. So that at present is set at the speed of um, light, no, set at the speed of a song 
um, called Halfway on the album and in the set list, which kind of just loops around in the background, I guess, when I'm playing that riff, so. Good thing about that pedal then is obviously as much as it's kind of serving its function there and it's a very specific tempo it's set to, it also just does nice ambient stuff if you kind of swell in and out, I guess. So. It is fairly kind of dynamically responsive in that respect, in that when you're kind of digging in, you hear the repeats kind of really leaping out, but if you kind of chill it out a little bit, it's just kind of quite a nice ambient texture, textural kind of thing in the background. Uh, moving on to, um, sacrilegiously, in no doubt, in many people's eyes, it is the HX Stomp XL by Line 6. I absolutely love it. Um, it's kind of a, a mini helix, I guess, in so many ways in that it actually has the amps and cabs in it and all that kind of stuff, which I don't use in a live scenario, but I've got one preset on there, which is pretty much a couple of effects that I need with an amp and a cab at the end of it, should everything go diabolically wrong during the space of a gig and you just need to take a direct out of that into the front of the house. So it's got that capability, I guess, if you need it, but um, that's set up for currently a couple of different presets um, for different tracks. So the one which is conveniently called Cardinal Black is just a bit of a kind of do it all. A um, couple of sounds for the set. So the main one that I've already used a couple of times is the harmonic trem. Don't tend to use it too much like that, ironically, over kind of lead stuff. It's more of a kind of chord thing, I guess, so. Yeah, something like that. Um, gets a lot of use of chords, as I said. So we've got a couple of delays on then, one which you actually heard, slap back. That's what it says on the tin. We've got a slightly longer delay uh, based on a memory man, I do believe. Gets a lot of use on the solos. We've got that reverb, which I showed you earlier. That tends to get used, um, as I referenced earlier, I tend to use the wah pedal as a little bit of a kind of filter more than anything. And there's one track which has that bucket load of reverb and a bit of wah pedal going on as well, which sounds a little bit like this. <laughs> Wow. 
as I said, gets used more as a kind of filter, I guess, throughout the chords, throughout the lead lines. It's almost constantly on for that track. And then the solo is, um, again, load of reverb. So again, depending on how hard you pick, um, or if you're kind of riding the volume knob at the same time, it kind of determines how much reverb you get, which is quite a cool little kind of quirk of that as well. It's quite dynamically responsive. Um, one thing which gets a little bit of use, kind of almost again as an ambient bed, um, is the final switch within this preset, um, which is Line 6 kind of version of the uh, Electro Harmonics Freeze. So if you check on that. Nice to use as, whether it's a little ambient bed or whether it's kind of an interlude between a track or whatever, just gives you a couple of options for kind of some pretty stuff. Um, the last in the chain, I tell a lie actually, I thought that was the last in the chain. The very last thing in the chain then, at least in terms of the Gig Rig G2, which is the kind of brain of everything, save me uh, Michael Flatley in it around for the set, is the Gurus Echo Sex. Gets a lot of use as my kind of main overdrive, I guess, or main overdrive, main delay rather, underneath overdrives for solos. So if we take a solo like a uh, track called Warm Love. definitely there and if it wasn't there you would miss it but it's not kind of leaping out or particularly in your face which I think is uh, is quite a cool little feature of that. Uh, moving on to the auxiliary board for when this one runs out of talent or its user runs out of talent more than likely. Um, the first pedal in the chain then is going to be the Deep Oggin by Thorpe Effects. Absolutely gorgeous sounding chorus. Um, nice and cheery and thick and all of the usual uh, superlatives um, or cliches that you would attach to a nice sounding chorus pedal um, in isolation. Gets you specifically on a Cardinal Black track called Where'd You Go, um, which is pretty kind of Ryan Adamsy, I guess, in its kind of um, style. Bit thrashy, bit kind of. That 
kind of thing. Um, and then over to a pedal, which only really gets used with a different guitar, actually. So if I switch that out for a second, it's the Boss um, RE202, the new Space Echo. Um, obviously kind of digital recreation of that uh, massive old unit from back in the day. Um, there's a couple of really cool features on this. I have it set currently to a, a kind of memory slot on it, um, which again is kind of tapped out to the tempo of a track called Terra Firma, um, which is the track on the album in which this gets used um, and live. Sounds a little bit like this. Not massively dissimilar, I guess, from the Echo Rec in some ways. Um, but again, as I said, it's set to a specific tempo, which if then you combine that with a couple of overdrives and reverbs and all that kind of stuff, gets a little bit crazy. So uh, sounds a little bit like this. first century Telstar, I guess, um, albeit a bit more mental. Um, there's a couple of things happening there, I guess. So that obvious function that I had first was the kind of hold function, I guess. So if you play a chord, you get a bit of a... Then the ramp, <laughs> which is fairly subtle there at the end, obviously when it's kind of tailing out, but if you give it a big old. The band absolutely hate that, um, every time that happens. Um, and then last in the chain, oh, let's do a bit of playing with actually, because that's a quite a cool. Something like that. The last pedal you saw me flicking on there was the Golden Reverberator um, from UA Audio, uh, Universal Audio even. It's kind of set for two different presets. We've got, if we chuck the reverb off on the amp for a second, it'll be a little bit more apparent. Two different presets within this, which one of which is a kind of fail safe for if any of the reverbs go down. It's the spring. It's the closest sounding spring to what's in that Pro Reverb that I've ever found. It sounds near enough identical. Um, let's test that, actually. That's a big old statement to make, isn't it? Amp Reverb. Universal Audio Reverb. Kind of gets very, very close. So that particular preset is if something goes drastically wrong. Um, the other one then, which uh, doesn't get so much use to be honest, is the um, kind of replacement for the reverb which is happening in the line six. Bit of a kind of drastic plate.
for the moment where it needs to get a little bit mental. Um, that's always there. It mixes particularly well with the Boss Space Echo as well, which I guess, again, the point of that is it all gets a little bit unruly and a bit crazy, so it's nice to kind of stack in with that. Um, and that's pretty much it in terms of pedals. In terms of gear then for guitars, I'm kind of leaning more heavily on the live rig at the minute, I guess, than the stuff I necessarily use to record the album. This is a more recent edition. This is the Squire 40th Anniversary Jazzmaster. Entirely stock, get a lot of questions in that respect. Might upgrade some parts on it at some point, but if for no other reason other than I just kind of like tinkering around with things, I guess. It's not as though there are any things which particularly need upgrading on it. Um, stays in tune, sounds great. And I like the kind of satin finish on it as well. It's one of those things that when you get the first thing on it, it looks absolutely terrible. And then the more you put on it, it starts to look quite cool. Um, and obviously the guitar that I play for the bulk of the set then is my custom Yamaha Revstar. Um, kind of heavily based on the 502 of the last Revstar series, so a wrap over tailpiece, 2 P90s, um, the inlay is taken from one of the kind of higher end 720s, um, volume tone, three way pickup position, uh, selector I should say, and that's kind of pretty much it. It's kind of the thing I like about this guitar, one of the things I like about this guitar is that it's kind of aged commensurately with me, I guess, when I got it. I did have a little bit of kind of crazing on it or checking as I'd asked for, but that's kind of uh, increased massively as of all the kind of little dings and dents and stuff, you know, that inevitably just get put on it over the course of touring it pretty hard. Um, we've just finished the headline tour now. We're back out again next month with Peter Frampton, um, supporting him, culminating at the Albert Hall. Um, so all things told, with everything that's kind of happened in the world relatively recently, it's nice to have been out and actually kind of gigging quite as heavily as we have been. And obviously this guitar then kind of shows the, uh, the battle scars to go with that. So... Um, that's pretty much it. As I said, this was the rig that was used to record the album, say for one or two little pieces, bits and pieces here and there. Um, I know it inside out, I know how everything sounds, I know how everything reacts to different pedals and stuff, so it just makes it, you know, especially when, as I said earlier, time is money, you're very focused on getting as much done as you quickly can, usually. It just makes that um, whole process a little bit more kind of uh, quick, I guess, for want of a better phrase. So, um, yeah, that's it. That's um, everything I buy in place of actual practice. Thank mm -hmm. you.